Uh, Gail is the co-founder of uh, Extinction Rebellion, uh, which was launched in October 2018. And there are now 260 groups in more than 30 countries. She's from Yorkshire. She's the daughter of a coal miner and a train, uh, trained in molecular biophysics, and she gets the livestock issue. Hey. Gail, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> So, standing before you as a rebel, I don't run a protest or a campaign with others. Uh, we're in active rebellion against the British government. You have a right and a duty to rebel when you're not being kept safe. And that's across the political spectrum. If you listen to Hobbes or Locke, who are on the right of the political spectrum, they would say you have a right to rebel. So I just wondered who else considers themselves a rebel here? because I'm hoping, that's great, that's great. It's about a quarter of the audience. I'm hoping that's gone up by the end of it. That's my aim, is to have rebellious farmers. We are in the sixth mass extinction event. There have been five major extinction in the past in humanity. Um, this is the first one for humanity. The Permian-Triassic extinction was caused by runaway climate change. 97% of our life was wiped out, and we are emitting carbon and heating the planet at a greater rate than the Permian-Triassic extinction. The way we say it in Extinction Rebellion, and perhaps this is the working class last from Yorkshire, I, I live in Gloucestershire, is we're fucked. We really have to get... <laughs> <clears throat> it's, it's, it's fun to lighten it up, actually, because it's so serious. It's so serious. It's good to lighten it up. Um, and this system's finished. Whether you like it or not, it's on its way out. Economic growth falls by a, at least 1% uh, for every degree of warming, and we're aiming for around 4 degrees of warming in the current situation, uh, so, some of which is seen as uh, leading to human extinction by some, some quarters. A 1 degree of warming, crops yields decrease by 10%, and there are also drought effects. At two and a half degrees C, the world cannot produce the calories needed. We also know that nourishment in foods drops by a third. So the end of century projections are that the population will grow by 50% and food production will half. In the academic literature, it's known as multi-breadbasket failure when you get issues across different harvests. Latvia and Lithuania last year declared their harvest national disasters and emergency situations. We know that food shortages and food price spikes trigger social collapse, which is why credible commentators like Professor Shell Nuber, who is the head of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research and an advisor to the German Chancellor to the European Union and the Pope, said that climate change is now reaching the end game the issue is the very survival of our civilization. He forwarded a paper, What Lies Beneath, which talked about the fact that the existential climate risk has been understated. The, when the IPCC says we've got 12 years to turn this around and talks about carbon, we don't have carbon budgets. There is no carbon left. There's 410 parts per million in the atmosphere. 270 was what was safe. You now have uh, Professor Sir David King starting a climate repair centre. That's the language we need to move into. We have to repair this situation. We don't have time left. Professor Jem Bendel's paper is the most uh, downloaded paper on deep adaptation, 450,000 downloads. He, his estimation is that social collapse is inevitable. It's coming soon that immense catastrophe is very likely. We're talking about massive loss of human life and that human extinction is possible. So we're talking uh, in the language of biological annihilation. Species endangers one in four mammals, one in eight birds, a third of all amphibians, 70% of the world's plants. This is the heritage that we're leaving for our children. And this country is one of the most nature-depleted countries in the world. They talk about the insect apocalypse. A 2017 study showed a 75% decline in flying insects. A 2018 study that one in five British mammals 
could be extinct within a decade. We have to face the grief of these times in actual fact because it's super painful. And if you just keep it in your head and not in your heart, you don't find the love that is required to step forward with the courage that's necessary. The IPBES, which is the IPCC's equivalent on biodiversity, said a million species are at risk of extinction. Wildlife is being destroyed by habitat destruction, overhunting, pollution, invasion by alien species, and also climate change. The ultimate cause is overpopulation and overconsumption by the rich. So something like 50% of all emissions is done by 10% of the population. So when, if you want to look at individual change that your children are begging for you to do when they're on the streets on school strikes, then the, 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 the flying and the consumption that people are doing needs to be tackled. If, if um, people would reduce their consumptions to that of the average European, this is figures from Professor Kevin Anderson, then carbon emissions would go down by a third. So there is an issue here of individuals as well as policy changes. It used to be the case that uh, I think the vast majority of animals in the world were wild animals, just a few percent of humans. Now 60% are livestock for food, 36% are humans, and only 4% are wild animals. And we know that we have an issue of soil erosion in the UK. We are 30 to 40 years away from a fundamental loss of fertility. In the, in the face of that, what do we do? Well, first of all, we, so we launched Extinction Rebellion on October the 31st last year on Sawain. And our, we have three demands. Firstly, that we have to tell the truth. The government has to tell the truth and the media has to tell the truth. And this is an existential crisis. This is not yet another policy issue. We demand uh, net zero actually by 2025 because this is a, needs a wartime economy and we want to see a tackling of biodiversity loss. If you have longer term targets, we know that business as usual means we'll just kick the ball into the long grass and we will let those targets be lost and, and we will be fucked if that's what happens. Uh, we don't take positions on specific bits of policy in Extinction Rebellion. There are debates out there. There is an animal rights lobby that, in my opinion, mixes up the issues around what they will talk about speciesism and how they feel about uh, uh, animal rights with an environmental argument. And there is also an argument, I think a very strong one personally, for regenerative agriculture, for pasture-fed livestock and so on. And the farming lobby needs to be with us on the streets making that case. In any case, how will we come up with policies? A citizens' assembly uh, will be called, which will not be the one that's uh, been announced recently because it will be legally binding. A citizens' assembly is chosen by sortition. It's random, like you would have a jury service. It's like Greek democracy was originally. And the ra random selection of people will make the policy decisions. They will be taught critical thinking skills and experts will be there. They won't be subject to poly uh, uh, lobbying and to the kind of uh, capture by vested interest that politics today is. And we want to see a just transition with that for both people in this country and for people uh, overseas. The solutions are many and I think it's so much about the land. This is an issue of ecology more than physics and it always worries me when we talk about carbon and carbon atoms as if it's a physics issue. It's about water, it's about nitrogen. So um, the land and the relationship with the land is super important. And whilst uh, as a scientist myself, I'm all into innovation and data and experiments, I think fundamentally the relationship that a farmer has with their land through deep connection to that land is, is the data that you actually need because all land is different. And when you make it all about data and, and, and so on, it can, it can take away from that lived experience of what you know about your own, your own land. Well, you know, when we launched on October 31st, what I thought was so utterly 
auspicious was that there was another group in Parliament Square with us. It was the Nature Friendly Farmers. Are any of them here today? Uh, you were out there with your wellies and your suits on, and I went over and I said, we need you. We are aligned. We might look like a bunch of crusty hippies, although we do try and look differently with our suits on and so on. Um, as I remember, you guys had paid £1,000 for public liability insurance, which I think is an absolute flipping travesty that people pay to be in Parliament Square. We were there breaking all the rules, with our amplification systems, with our banners, saying this is our democracy, this is how we do democracy, and we took over the streets and blocked the road outside of Parliament. Um, and that's what I'm really calling for you farmers to join us in. Uh, here's an experiment uh, about water retention. So on the, on the left-hand side, you can see that when you have a healthy pasture, uh, water is retained. I think the farming lobby needs to not just talk about carbon capture, but talk about Jem Bendel's agenda of adaptation. How are we going to survive these times when you're going to have incredible fluctuations in the weather? We know that the world's farms have lost 50 to 70 percent of their carbon. Um, there are um, carbon cutting toolkits online and soil health apps you can use to, to move in the right direction that hedgerows could increase their carbon capture by 50%. And here's a beautiful slide that was shared with me uh, by uh, Dr. John Meadsley from the Pasture Fed Livestock Association. You can see in the background what it looks like when you have an unhealthy relationship with the land, uh, when, it's, when there's a drought. And the, and the land is suffering, and this beautiful, healthy pasture. And my understanding is that cattle can self-medicate uh, with that kind of pasture. So we need to call in the old ways in a new way. So we took to the streets in April in an active rebellion against the government, against the British government, and it was an international rebellion. We, uh, we smashed uh, a window of the Shell building, and that was in honour of Polly Higgins, a beautiful uh, lawyer who is calling for the law of ecocide and unfortunately died in April, but her work uh, based in Stroud continues. Um, and that smashing of the windows is so that we can go have a jury trial to say that Shell knew what was happening uh, for many years around the climate emergency. We occupied London over five locations over 11 days. There were over 1,000 arrests. Uh, the figures have actually changed. Uh, we're now over 130 groups across the UK. We're in 58 different countries. And what we're doing is based in science, actually. It's in social science, how things change. Lobbying your MP, signing petitions, going on marches, it doesn't work. It helps raise the issue, but you need an active confrontation when you want to see change. It can be beautiful, it can be peaceful, it can be respectful, but that's what's necessary and that's what takes uh, change to happen. And people celebrate rebellions and civil disobedience from the past and they say, wasn't it wonderful, Martin Luther King and the suffragettes? But when it's today, they go, oh my goodness, you know, you're inconvenienced in Londoners. And I do apologise, it's not cool to do that to people, but it's clear that when you look at this graph, which is the concern about the environment, which sp spiked in 2014 with a flooding and grew in the autumn with the school strikes, with the IPCC, David Attenborough's uh, productions and so on. And you can see there the spike when Extinction Rebellion protests work. This form of change is necessary and works, and you must be part of it. <coughs> you don't actually need uh, everybody to get involved in an active rebellion, you need up to 3.4% of the population. And you don't need people to like you, but you need them to be having the conversation. And that's what happens when you create disruption. So here's Greta Thunberg saying, you only talk about moving forwards with the same bad ideas that got us into this mess. The government's announced net zero by 2050, way too long in the future, and a very unjust thing to do to other countries. And they're are going to be having a citizens' assembly, but again, it's not legally binding. Where's DEFRA in that citizens' assembly? Why is the farming community not being included? Are you not a business? Uh, I think that you guys need to be absolutely at the heart of that and not seen as a, a poor relation, and that the issues of rural poverty and land justice need to be raised at the same time. 
So we are calling on a rebellion for the autumn, and we're really asking you to join us and stop being so fucking British. Can we not get like the French? And uh, seriously, bring some tractors into the centre of London to the rebellion, you know? This is not going to happen by nice, polite lobbying where you pay a £1,000 for a picture, folks. This is what it's going to take. Um, the innovations there, the solar tractors I've seen, it's, it's, it's brilliant, but it won't come through on the, on the volume that's needed without getting on the streets. So join us and bring your tractors. And let's have that healthy debate. Cows. I, the animal rights folks might have a word. Would they be safe? Would they be happy? I don't know. But um, let's have those debates, you know, with, 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 with vegans coming from an animal rights perspective. Make your case. Let's get on the streets together. It needs all of us, folks. Join us. Bring your tractors.